Awesome. Okay. So today we're going to be going over Aztec food and drink at the time of European conquest and contact. So that will be approximately 1519 to 1521, a pretty limited amount of time, but we have an outrageous amount of information about what the Aztec common people were eating at exactly that period. Um, so this is me. Hi, this is my name in the society is Il Cachiwat, but you are happy to call me Isma of Marinus. That's how I'm referred to most of the time. I have some contact information there if you have any questions after the class is over. Um, just because this class was originally conceived to be about an hour long and my understanding is that we have about 45 minutes to get through all of it. So if you have questions, um, I'm on Facebook under my mundane name and then I'm also on Instagram as SCA Isma. I'm also the Facebook uh, list mom for SCA New World Personas, which is a group for people who have a New World Persona, who are curious about New World Personas, or just want to support people with a New World Persona. It's a really fun group, over 100 members now, lots of great uh, research and chats about how we can encourage thoughtful and inclusive research about um, the tribes and culture groups that were present in Mesoamerica um, prior to the 17th century. So we'll be happy to have you there. Uh, feel free to message me if you have any questions. So this is just a quick overview of the class um, and what we'll be talking about today or trying to talk about all of this today. Um, if at any point you have a question about these topics, um, like uh, Mr. Spanish just said, please just leave them in the, the chat box. I'm happy to answer them throughout the class just so that we kind of stay um, in the same food group as we move along. Um, so we're going to first start with a overview of agricultural methods and how in the world a city on an island was feeding half a million people. And then we'll go over all of their kind of staple food groups. So carbs, the maize and the corn, how they got protein, where they're getting their fats from, what kind of spices the Aztec people were regularly using. Of course, your staple food group of alcohol, got to go over that. And then we'll finish up with some chat about chocolate, cacao, the drink that they prepared, the, the most famous of Aztec foods. This picture here um, is um, directly going into uh, the discussion about maize and corn, but I'll discuss it now since it's on the screen. Um, corn was, of course, one of the most important food groups of the Aztec people, and they actually had some superstitious beliefs that the most important thing you can do in harvesting corn is to breathe on the corn to give your own, a bit of your own life and energy into the corn um, so that it could be passed on to those who ate it. And I think that says a lot about how Aztec people saw their food and how they saw food preparation as not just your day-to-day, -day, um, your day-to-day -day you have to, you have to eat to live, but also the people who prepare and supply your food are also essential pieces of um, a deeper cultural um, place in your, in your society. They are important as, um, they're as important as priestly figures in the sense that they pass on their own life and their own um, passions and loves to you through their food. And I think that kind of reflects today in modern Mexican cooking as well. Uh, I do pause anytime I do an intro to Aztec cultures class or a class where we are um, addressing mostly people who do not have a huge background in Aztec um, history or Mesoamerican history. I always pause and put this graphic on the screen um, because unlike a European class or a class about a European topic, there is a huge gap in our knowledge. Most people at least in the United States, when we're learning about history, we learn very, very little about who the Aztec people were and very little about what kind of tribes and culture groups existed in ancient Mesoamerica. Um, so to assure you, Aztec people were, of course, the dominating military and cultural force in Mesoamerica at the time of European contact. That's not debatable. But there were tons of other cultural groups. And what we are specifically talking about in this class will be um, the people who lived in the central city of Tenochtitlan and the city-states that were directly influenced by it. Those would be the traditional Aztec people. Um, so 
what I specifically want to say with this slide is these food norms were very important to the Aztec people, but there are a huge wide range of cultural groups in ancient Mexico that had different ways of thinking about food, different ways of thinking about food culture. And those are all just incredible little deep dives that you could go into um, if you wanted to. So you will see some variation on belief systems, food preparations, et cetera, throughout ancient Mexico. But this class is specifically about what was being prepared in Tecnoctitlan and the area around Tecnoctitlan. So um, if you have heard things about ancient Mexican cooking that disagree or contradict what I'm about to say, um, one, I'd love to hear about it because I wanna make this class as, as inclusive and, and full and complete as I can, but it may also have to do with another cultural group um, that was um, perhaps not as prominent as Aztec people, but maybe had a slightly more uh, interesting or unique or exotic way of preparing their food, which was passed down and shared amongst um, primarily white or colonial historians. So chinampas, what are chinampas? Chinampas are what I was talking about earlier, how in the world a city on a lake creates enough food for half a million people. Um, one of the things that is, I think, shocking to a lot of people is to learn that the city of Tignoctaclan just itself, not even including the surrounding kind of suburbs of the city and not including the other city states that the Aztecs controlled, um, there were somewhere between 400,000 to 500,000 people living on this island in Lake Texcoco. Insane. It's an insane number of people for the area that it is and for a cultural group that I think a lot of people kind of um, very early on in history kind of dismissed as a, bar a barbarous, barbaric culture. Um, but they weren't. There were thousands and thousands of people um, living and doing some very sophisticated things agriculturally in order to support that group. And one of that is the Chinampas. These are the floating islands or water gardens that you will see referenced in um, Mexican agricultural history or in kind of explainers on Aztec culture. Um, so the city of Tecnoctitlan, as I said, is on an island in the middle of Lake Texcoco. It's unclear when exactly it was founded, but we're thinking like 1320, 1325, and it existed all the way until 1521. And as I said, half a million people were living there in 1521. So they create enough food for these people, maize, beans, squash, uh, tomatoes, all on these, or mostly on these small, kind of rectangle-shaped islands that they have built up. They're artificial islands created by with mud and basically compost decaying plants or deca decaying food matter. And they're kind of stacked on top of each other and then secured to the lake bed using reeds or wood, something strong but bendable that can kind of move with the water. And the picture on the left is obviously a picture that is period. And the picture on the right is um, modern chinampas. This is still an agricultural method that is used in Mexico today. Although, of course, it's a little bit more sophisticated. There's a lot more science that goes into where you place the chinampa and what you include and what you grow there. So this would be um, basically how they managed to grow so much food in such a relatively small area for such a large amount of people. The primary food crop, this is going to be no surprise to anyone who knows anything about New World cooking, corn. This is an essential crop not just to the Aztec people, but to the New World as a whole. Many, many cultures throughout the New World um, consider corn to be kind of the staple food. For the Aztec people, um, the word for tortilla or for the, 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 the bread that you make from maize powder or maize flour can translate to the flesh of our people um, or the flesh of our life. Um, that can show you kind of how essential the day-to-day -day consumption of maize flour was to them. They even have mythologies that uh, predate what we're talking about. These mythologies would have been closer to the founding of Tecnoctitlan back in the 1300s or 1200s, um, 
that say that humans were actually crafted from the softened maize flour that was used for tortillas or tamal. And um, I don't see that that necessarily was something that was actively believed at the time that Hernan Cortez arrives. Um, that seems to have come from an earlier civilization that lived in Mesoamerica. Um, but uh, it it's kind of shows the um, kind of cultural norms surrounding corn and why corn was so important. Um, in Tenochtitlan, a common kind of simple meal that you would see um, in a home would just be maybe a corn tortilla dipped in some chili pepper sauce, eaten with shredded vegetables, squash, or um, uh, or filled with um, the same things that they would be filling tamales with, which were eggs, honey, beans, um, rabbit meat, or turkey meat. Those were also served inside of tortillas. I even have seen some references that sometimes people in um, this period would simply wrap a raw jalapeno in a corn tortilla and eat that. So if you want to wake up, if you're feeling a little sluggish, um, you know, a raw jalapeno in a corn tortilla, that should probably do it. Um, tamale are another form of uh, maize food that we, like, like tortillas, we still eat today. Um, what you do to create a tamale, if you've never done it before, is um, basically the kernel is soaked in kind of an ashy water, um, and then it's washed, and the hull is removed, and then you, you turn it into flour. The same thing is used for tortillas, but with tamales, it remains a little more um, soft and isn't dried. Um, this preparation is called mixed tamalization, and you use it to create like I said, the tortillas and tamales, but you can also create dried hominy kernels after the process, which goes into a soup. Um, the hominy soup that we have today is a little bit different. Um, it, uh, pozole is what we call it today. Um, that's a little different. It's way spicier today than it would have been back in the day as far as we can tell. Um, it's a lot more flavorful today and it of course includes a lot more ingredients than they would have had necessarily access to. It also appears from research that I'm doing right now and that I would like to continue doing that the pozole we have today has a lot more tomato products in it where they would not necessarily have had the tomato products in that soup, but we'll see. Um, after going through this whole mixed tamalization process, the corn is mashed and formed. The tortillas would have been roasted by placing them on warm stones or into a stone oven. Tamales are a little bit different. Tamales are a steamed product. So the kind of mush of the corn is stuffed back into the husk and then steamed with these fillings, these eggs, this honey, beans, etc. The hominy kernels were also used as a dried snack food. So you could dry out the kernels, kind of like, um, I'm trying to think of, there, there, there is a modern equivalent, just like dried corn kernels, basically. Um, and they would have been tossed with um, chili pepper or, um, or an, another spice and, and shared that way. Um, corn nuts, yes. They're kind of like corn nuts. Um, so that is um, one, one way of thinking about the, the product there. Um, did we have any questions about corn processes or? I'm slightly insulted at the thoughts of tomatoes in pasole. Uh, <laughs> I agree and disagree. I've been given many pasoles with tomato products in them. So I guess it just depends on what area of the world that uh, your cook is from. move on. Protein. So one of the big problems with um, living on an island in the middle of a lake is that there's not a lot of space to grow or, or to raise um, animals for meat. Um, in addition to the fact that there simply are not a lot of um, kind of food, uh, like livestock, in central Mexico, native to central Mexico. There just really isn't a lot of space in Tecnoctoclan at the time to do that. Um, so most Aztec people lived a vegetarian lifestyle. Um, like I say in the slide, it's not by choice. It's really just by necessity. The cost of meat is quite high and um, 
the land space needed to grow or to raise that meat again not necessarily in like prime like primarily available so their regular protein source would have been beans and another grain called amaranth which if you've ever heard of amaranth or tried amaranth it's tasty um, amaranth was um, basically roasted and served kind of like just this is an easy uh, meal covered with honey or chocolate as a treat um, you may have heard of a Spanish tree called Alegrea. Um, we used to eat it in my house around Halloween or All Souls Day, and you would form it into sugar skulls and eat it that way. Um, I think I, I, it is pretty common in my culture, which my family is Cuban and American, and we ate this treat pretty regularly. So I don't know how common it is outside of like Cuban American households, um, but uh, it is still something that we eat today. Um, and the Aztec practiced um, kind of a similar situation with forming um, the amaranth into this treat as well. They had a festival in the winter, which was kind of like an amaranth festival. And they would form this cooked amaranth with the chocolate or the honey into um, images of the various agricultural gods or the god of the house. Um, they make the statue, of course, the amaranth and honey and then leave it in the place of, um, in a place of honor within their home, and then slowly over time kind of cut from the god, cut from the statue, and um, eat little bits of it over the course of the celebration, which um, research shows, uh, my research shows it could be anywhere from one day to like four or five days. It just kind of depends on um, which source you're looking at. So um, amaranth also creates a really, really beautiful, like kind of red, wine colored dye um, which was very common also within Aztec culture though not necessarily relevant to um, food ways and how we prepare food. Um, they did also participate in some hunting and gathering. One thing that I didn't include on this slide for whatever reason is insects. The Aztecs are great insect eaters. Um, things like grasshoppers are definitely included in the Aztec diet and were served to Hernan Cortez when he arrived. Um, typical types of animal meat that were consumed include rabbit, pelican, small lizards like axolotls, if you've ever seen one of those. Um, very cute, but allegedly also very tasty. Um, turkey and deer. Um, like I said before, this isn't something that people are eating every day, um, maybe a couple of times a week at most, and mostly for um, special occasions for things like deer or turkey. Um, the picture that is included here shows them, um, I, th I believe this picture is actually of Mayan hunters rather than Aztec, culture, Aztec hunters um, taking, taking down a pelican to be prepared for food. Um, another fun one that has a lot of misconceptions about it in um, kind of modern thinking about Aztec people are avocados. This is a um, very important piece of the Aztec food way. Um, no seafood. Oh, oh gosh. Isma, seafood? Seafood, absolutely, absolutely. I do not know why I did not include seafood in here, but yes, the Aztec people are very big fish eaters. But again, this is not an av a normal occurrence, something that they eat every day, maybe a couple of times a week. Um, I did go back and edit this. Hmm. But yes, definitely seafood, um, usually steamed or roasted, just like any of the other proteins. Again, not something that we're eating every single day, um, but still an important piece of asset culture that I just completely forgot to mention. It's fine. Uh, avocados. Um, I'm sorry, let me back up, back up. Avocados. We have lots and lots of huge misconceptions about avocados. There's lots of rumors about how avocados were eaten and what avocados um, meant to the Aztec people. A very common thing that I am confronted with when I talk about Aztec foodways is, oh, did you know that women weren't allowed to eat avocados? Um, let me assure you that that was not the case. Um, it's unclear where that rumor started or why that rumor would start, except um, some attempt to create some kind of misogyny within Aztec culture that didn't exist. Not to say that Aztec people were some kind of like utopian society for women, but um, it seems like an attempt to create a 
division between men and women in Aztec society that didn't exist. Um, there's this idea that because the word avocado means testicles in um, their native language, that somehow women were not supposed to eat it. Um, that seems to have been an untruth. Um, women were encouraged to eat avocados, ate avocados regularly while they were pregnant, were given avocados specifically as a gift to celebrate the pregnancy. Um, it appears that the use of the word avocado, which means avocado, as a word for testicles is kind of a slang word. Um, not really, um, it's not that the word avocado means testicle, the word means avocado, it's just a slang term for testicles. And it was misinterpreted or misunderstood over time to mean that this was some kind of masculine food. But the avocado is actually, sure. Would um, a modern equivalent be huevos? Absolutely. Huevos, nuts, balls, anything like that. Anything where um, the word, uh, oh, uh, this one's fun. An yeah. anal analogous to the future, says Erica. Anthropologists thinking men can't eat melons. Yes, that, that is exactly um, what we're looking at here, is just a misunderstanding, I think, of um, a, a foreign language and a foreign culture. But avocados were, of course, a huge source of fat. Um, this is especially important to a culture that doesn't eat a lot of meat. And if a lot of the meat that they're eating is quite lean or the proteins they're taking in are quite lean, they're not going to have a lot of fat on them anyway. So avocados become essential in that way. Um, the avocados, from what I can tell, that were present in ancient Mexico were a little different than the avocados we have today. Um, if you've ever seen what are sometimes labeled Florida avocados, where there's just a huge, huge seed in the middle with not very much kind of uh, meat around the edge, that would have been more like what you were getting um, versus like a Haas avocado that you get in the store today. Um, but the flavors are fairly similar, though the texture is, is different. Um, the avocados served as a sauce base. The sauce is called guacamole, which you can see how that turns into guacamole over time. Um, it appears that the sauce that they were creating is a little less chunky and thick and like ready for chips than we would have. It was definitely creamier, placed on top of any number of things, served with amaranth, served on top of um, meat, fish, etc. Um, so it's a little more of a sauce, less of a dip, if you will. Um, the picture on here is a, you see a man with his avocado tree just sitting there waiting for an avocado to get ready, though I think he might be waiting a long time. Um, and then on the right side is a pictograph for a city called Awataklan, which is a city um, kind of adjacent to the Nautiklan, where um, the whole city is important because there are so many avocado trees. Um, so it's just a whole city that is known for providing this essential fat, um, mostly to the central city. Spices. Um, one of the best things about cooking ancient Mexican cuisine is that you have a huge array of spices and flavors to work with. Um, so chili peppers, um, so this is jalapenos, poblano, etc., regularly eaten, roasted and raw, wrapped in tortilla, placed inside tamales, um, just eaten by themselves. Um, it's unclear how spicy or not they were. I've read, um, when I first presented this class, the reading I had been done said that they were way less spicy. Now I'm reading some that say they were way more spicy. It's, is, it, is it possible to know? Probably not. Um, but just as a, um, just to mention that, uh, they also dried up chili peppers, ground them into powder. The powder is then used to flavor other dishes, the soups, the sauces, the meats. Um, this was the most popular seasoning by far, uh, was these ground chili peppers. But there were lots of other spices available, spices and herbs available as well. Um, culantro, which is still regularly used in uh, Mexican and Hispanic cooking. Um, garlic vine, allspice, and avocado leaves were also used. So the whole avocado plant really was used towards um, 
creating more flavor and putting more flavor into their food. They also collected wild mushrooms, dried these, ground them up, used them as a spice powder the same way, um, I don't know, you would use like a, like a truffle powder or something, something to add just a much deeper resonant flavor to your food. And um, all of these different spices were used extremely liberally. The Aztec people seemed to not just enjoy spice and flavor, but seemed almost addicted to it. Perhaps um, it is because they are living on a relatively um, limited diet, um, but this was used all the time. Most Aztec people are not eating a huge garlic vine. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let's go back. Culantro, is culantro cilantro? Absolutely not. Culantro and cilantro are different. Um, you can go to uh, any kind of Mexican market or Hispanic market. You'll find something called culantro base. Um, it does have a different flavor. Um, I have used cilantro in place of culantro before. It is a very different flavor and you will not be getting the same flavor. Um, but Badia and um, La Preferida make a really good culantro base, if you're curious. That one's good. Garlic vine is a type of vine not related necessarily to garlic. Um, it has a garlicky flavor, though it's kind of a wild onion. Um, you can also get this at Hispanic markets, usually. Um, it kind of looks like scallions, but more long and like vine like it 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 to me it's kind of hard to describe i should have probably put a picture in there for you um uh mr spatrice also left a, a link in here for is culantro the same as cilantro um if any of you are curious about trying out um this ingredient um so we're at 30 minutes and this class is supposed to be 45 minutes so we're gonna we're gonna go um uh, alcohol. Alcohol, staple food, very important. Um, so uh, the um, Aztec people consumed something called pulque or octil. These are uh, alcohols made from the fermented sap of an agave plant. Um, this is, uh, there is some evidence that they also distilled the same material to create an, a, an additional different type of alcohol. Um, which I'm hoping to uh, be able to add more information about in a future iteration of this class. Um, alcohol is an essential piece of Aztec culture, but it's also a piece of Aztec culture that was um, controlled a lot um, by the upper class. So the Aztec are kind of famous in ancient Mesoamerica for being extremely strict morality-wise. Um, the Aztec people uh, did not particularly enjoy um, deviance. They didn't want people um, moving away from kind of the central idea of their culture, which was a, uh, a culture where, where war and perpetuation of the bloodline was very, very essential. So anything that might encourage you to move away from that center of gravity, that center of cultural norm, including alcohol, was very, very strictly controlled. I actually have a class that I'm teaching on morality law and deviance within Aztec culture for the Barony of Marinus. That class is on July 28th at 7 p.m. U.S. Eastern Standard Time. If you're very interested in that, um, you can find that on the Barony of Marinus's Facebook page. And that will go more in depth about what these morality laws entailed in terms of gender and sexuality, which were the two aspects of culture that they were most trying to control by limiting alcohol. There is this idea that alcohol makes you crazy, it makes you reveal parts of yourself that are um, unacceptable, um, which can include loose sexual practices, same-sex attraction, or um, leaving the uh, kind of expectations of your gender. So pulque, octil, um, these are words for essentially the same thing. Octil is the um, Nahua word for this. Pulque is the Spanish word for the same or very similar products. Um, these 
um, laws controlled who could drink those items and in what contexts. Priests, of course, can drink however much they want because they use it for seeing visions and communing with the spirits and communicating with gods. Um, and of course, the king can drink as much as he wants, but your average everyday person or people who are associated with the king but are not within the king's household, um, they are um, not allowed to consume as much. They also have a very strong association of uh, pulque with the goddess Tlozotel. Um, She is a goddess of filth and disgust, of um, trash even. Um, it's also very interesting that this goddess is also associated with female sexuality. Um, so uh, you can take from that what you will, and of course come discuss it with me next week or hmm, about, about two weeks from now, uh, and what it means that a goddess of garbage, essentially, and a garbage of poor behavior is also the goddess who uh, deals with how women have sex, and uh, why she is so associated with alcohol. Now, here is the fun one that everybody, everybody loves. This is a really fun um, aspect of talking about uh, Aztec foodways is cacao and chocolate um, because cacao and chocolate are something we enjoy today and it's always interesting to see how different chocolate consumption and beliefs about chocolate were compared to what um, what we believe about chocolate today. There's also a huge amount of misconceptions about chocolate within Aztec culture who was able to drink chocolate and why. Um, Alcohol and chocolate were treated in a lot of the same ways. Um, morality laws about chocolate and alcohol are not completely dissimilar. However, chocolate was considered so much more important for your spiritual well-being than alcohol that um, it, it's kind of like the almost the opposite of alcohol, where chocolate is considered the, the positive spiritual um, drink, whereas alcohol is considered a negative spiritual drink. Um, so uh, the actual cacao beans were used both for snacks. People just ate the bitter cacao as a raw substance or a slightly prepared or roasted substance. But the most important way of consuming chocolate seems to have been in this, this frothy, um, bitter drink that they consumed. Um, unlike chocolate drinks later on in period where there's um, quite a bit of an attempt to make them a little more sweet or a lot more sweet, uh, the Aztecs seemed to have enjoyed them mostly bitter um, or spiced with uh, chili pepper or um, honey um, or um, even sometimes fat from the protein that they that they prepared. So like turkey fat or um, or fat from deer. Uh, the picture on the right is showing the preparation of the chocolate drink and how um, the frothy drink came to be. So the chocolate is prepared in one dish and then alternated between two dishes over and over again until it forms kind of a thick head on the top. And that that frothy head is is the most desirable piece of um, of the chocolate drink. So you just lift it up, pour it from on high until you get the amount of froth that you want. And in fact, this would have been done almost so much as to create almost no liquid at the bottom. It would have been almost entirely um, of this, this frothy mixture, which um, was served either warm or cold, either way. Um, it's just, you, you would want to, um, you would want to serve it cold, um, obviously in the summer, but the, the hot drink was used for ritual purposes, um, whereas the cold drink seems to have been more of like the daily consumption or the daily chocolate consumption for royalty, aristocrats, priestly class, things like that, or high level merchants who um, were particularly trading in cacao. Um, cacao is also one of the big reasons for Aztec war, um, warways and, and, and aggression the Aztec were not able to grow the amount of cacao that they needed to sustain their chocolate drinking in the area around Tecnoctitlan while still providing food for citizens. So the Aztec 
were um, primarily uh, engaged in um, war in order to acquire cacao and slaves. So those are the two pieces that they were most worried about in terms of uh, kind of the sacking and pillaging of other Mesoamerican cultures, including the Quiche Maya, who very famously grew cacao in their area, which was further south than, than modern Mexico City, where Tecnoctitlan would and the Aztec uh, people would have been mostly living. The Quiche Maya are uh, quite a bit way south, but the Aztecs still made plenty of time to march down there and steal people for, for slavery and to make sure that they took plenty of tribute in the form of cacao beans. Cacao is also used in some areas of the Aztec cultural world as money. That's how essential it was. You could use it to trade um, for other essentials because it was believed that um, the drinking of this, of this beverage was pretty essential to your, your, like I said, your spiritual health. So the value of the cacao would go up and down with the season and you could purchase all number of, of items essential and not so essential um, using cacao beans. Uh, did anyone have any questions about chocolate or about anything in the class really? This is the end of the slide and I'm very sorry if I rushed through but I wanted to make sure that we got as much in in 45 minutes as we possibly could. I'll give you guys a second if you have any questions for the chat. Bronwyn says, interesting class. Yeah. Oh, thank you. It is fascinating. I'm starving now. I don't know about the rest of the class. <laughs> <laughs> My husband is at a, a brewing event right now, um, and he says that he's going to make some fresh corn tortillas for me to celebrate after this, so we'll oh. see. Good husband. Uh, Bryce asks, has anyone tried preparing cacao with animal fat? I have not. I think it sounds disgusting and <laughs> not really something I want to try. Um, I did read a blog. I want to say that it was in Spanish, so I'm not sure if I'll, I'll see if I can find it. But um, I did read a blog uh, where somebody did try it and they said that it was just made it very, very thick um, and creamy. Um, I don't necessarily know that it's imparting a ton of flavor. Um, and here it's, uh, Juliana says, maybe like adding butter to coffee. Yeah, I, I think it might have a similar um, mouthfeel to that. Yeah, it sounds thick to me. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 my assumption when I read that was that this would have been perhaps less for flavor and more for sustenance. It seems very often that um, the, the, the use of fat was used to kind of just keep you going instead of necessarily um, being just like a pleasurable drink, more of a like a sustenance type drink, the way that um, people who do like keto or low carb do um, kind of like that bulletproof coffee. Right, right. Uh, let's see. Aisha says, do you know of an old recipe for chocolate? I know they didn't use sugar. Did they use other spices in the chocolate or drink? Yes. So the most common spice for the bitter chocolate would have been um, chili powder. So the ground chili powder, ground jalapenos, ground chipotle, um, things like that would have been added. So chipotle, of course, is just dried jalapeno. But um, that that mix would have been added to make this spicy chocolate drink. Um, a similar idea is kind of the, the Mexican hot chocolate that you'll see around sometimes where it's like hot chocolate with chili pepper in it. Um, so that idea is a reflection of how Aztec people would have drunk their chocolate or like the most, like the how they would have commonly consumed it. Um, honey was also added. So there is a, a sweeter option um, though I s suspect, given how bitter chocolate is in its raw form, um, kind of the, the raw form of the, the chocolate, I don't know that the honey would have necessarily made it super sweet. I think the amount of honey that you would have had to include would be pretty extreme to make it a sweet drink. Someone, uh, Ron would ask, is cinnamon New World? 
I've tasted the Mexican hot chocolate with cinnamon in it. Um, I would have to get back to you on that. I do not know off the top of my head. And I, I, I obviously don't want to give you incorrect information. Yeah. So if I, sort of a follow-up question. Uh, mm -hmm. Catherine Swift says, I read that horchata came from Spain to the New World, but I always thought it came from the New World to Spain. What is your opinion? It's a good question because I love horchata and I would love for it to be New World so I can include it in my New World feasts. Um, I haven't done any research on horchata, um, but the process of making like a frothy horchata, I don't think would be dissimilar to the process of making like a frothy chocolate drink. Um, so that would be another, another thing that I want to put down on my list and, and see if we can find some more information about that. Okay, Isma, uh, did the Maya take their chocolate differently? Yes, Which absolutely. I've she says, the research that I've done says that cinnamon was more common for flavoring chocolate than chiles. Then again, I can only research in English, so. <laughs> um, well, I would say that the Maya did take their chocolate differently. Um, my research has shown that the Maya were preferential towards that honey chocolate that I was describing less than chilies. Um, kind of going with the conversation we were having earlier, I cannot say specifically if cinnamon was available to them in period, um, well, prior to European contact. Um, so uh, Juliana in the chat had mentioned that cinnamon is from the West Indies. So I do not know if there is a cinnamon equivalent in um, ancient Mesoamerica that would have been included in any kind of Mayan drink. Um, so that is going to be something that I will definitely put on my list for kind of future chocolate deep dives. I mean, it's at the bar, Castle. It's, it's not the case. Uh, it sounds like someone escaped the microphone, police. Solveig, yeah. could you mute yourself, please? Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? And we have some ongoing discussion in the chat about horchata. Yes, I see. Very, very exciting. So my family um, has a lot of like family history where they um, sort of it kind of passed on that uh, my great grandmother was descended from Taino. So I would be very, very interested to see more information about the drink and about how it was prepared. So thanks so much, Aisha, for putting that in the chat. I will definitely be taking a look at that and, and seeing what I can learn. Um, Erica Veras asks, do you have a blog or a place where you have recipe redactions from your New World research? I, I don't because I didn't know that that was going to be something of such interest. This is my first class that I put together for this and I'm super excited to share it all with you. Um, I you would absolutely like... absolutely need a website. <laughs> I would love to have a website. I would love to have these things. My Spanish isn't great, but it has been helpful to kind of find more information um, that isn't widely available in English. So um, I think that it will be, yes, this is my first class. Um, I taught this class at the University of Atlantia um, after speaking with several people at um, a Marinus event. We had an event in Marinus called the Day of Love and uh, myself and Alessandra de Montegiorni, who is a, uh, an amazing ANS like goddess in Marinus, um, put together a display on chocolate because it was a Valentine's Day event, and we decided to um, put together a, a display on chocolate. And I had so many people come to me and say that uh, they had no way of taking in this information about Aztec culture and Aztec foodways because they didn't know enough about how Aztecs were eating in the first place. Um, so that's why this class exists. It is not designed to be completely comprehensive. It's really meant to be a jumping off point. And I really hope that if you have ever wanted to do New World research or you are interested in having a New World persona, um, if you would get in touch with me or if you um, learn enough from this class to maybe have uh, an idea of where you want to go in the future, maybe something that um, in this class kind of inspires you to keep going. 
And Isma, I've just dropped the title of that oh. Camilla Townsend book in that you recommended. Yep. So I, I bought it and read it after her first class. It's really, it's really engaging. So yes. So this is the book that she just dropped in there. It's called Fifth Son. I have some other books that I can show you guys, but this book is an awesome book if you have basically, even if you have no knowledge of Aztec culture ways, Aztec history, this book is written in such a way that you can start from absolute zero and come out with a pretty good understanding of um, what we're looking at, especially with period Aztec people. And it's pretty short. It's, it's a short little one. Like you can definitely get Aztec books that are hundreds of pages long. Um, so this is a really cool, um, really cool book. If um, that's something of interest to you, um, if we have a couple of our minutes, I'm just going to show you two more. Um, if you have a very specific interest, um, there is a book that is available called An Aztec Herbal. It is a codex um, from 1552, 1550, 1552, and it is just pictures and illustrations of various herbs and um, spite, uh, herbs and plants that were available to Aztec people and um, what they were used for. Um, and it's just a really cool book to start looking through. Some of the um, items are not easy to understand what they're supposed to be, um, but uh, I am still learning a lot. I'm going through it very, very slowly and trying to find each of these different plants in kind of a modern context and see what we can find. Another book, um, if you're interested specifically in chocolate, is um, this one. It is True History of Chocolate by Sophie Coe. Um, they are food anthropologists and food historians, and this book is not all about um, Aztec people or even Mayan people or even Mesoamerica. It, it goes from like kind of the beginning of history all the way, I think, to like the 1800s. Um, it, it's a really great book, lots and lots of information. Absolutely recommend it if you're looking for um, a fun uh, introduction to chocolate specifically. Um, she has a ton of other books too about um, early cuisine that I recommend as well. This one is just one that I show people um, when we're talking about chocolate uh, because I think that um, I think people would get a kick out of it and it has information about other um, like Iberian culture groups that um, that might be of interest to other people in this in this class. So those were those would be my three uh, suggestions if you wanted to start deep diving some Mesoamerican food <laughs> Mesoamerican food research. I'm not trying to be an enabler on Amazon, but I definitely do recommend going through, and you'll end up you'll end up with more books than you know what to do with. <laughs> Uh, could we repost the info on the upcoming Aztec sexuality course? I will, um, let me see. Yeah, the, the, I tried to grab it from the Barony of Marinus, but their, um, their group is private, so. My bad. Okay, <laughs> let me, <laughs> let me jump on here real quick. We have a, I do not know if our MOAS has posted yet the event. Um, but it will be on, so this is the open, I'm going to post the link in here real quick. I can make this work. Send to everyone in meeting, not just private. Okay. Um, so this is the open Facebook page where we post our events that are coming up. Um, I will ask our MOAS to make a actual event for this class. Um, today if she can um, so that you guys can follow just that class if you're not all that interested in what's going on in Virginia Beach which I, I get it if you're not in Virginia Beach why would you be <laughs> but um, uh, this um, I'll have her put the class up it is on July 28th and it is titled so far I'm calling it deviance in Aztec culture and so we're going to like I said go over um, sexuality groups, minority groups um, for gender, and we are going to touch slightly on um, criminality and and how and how crime was dealt with in uh, 
in Aztec society.